Um, let's move on to the second chapter of the abolition of man. So opening up to discussion, what did you guys think in general um, of this chapter? Um, as well as if you, uh, if you saw it, the, the supplementary one um, being, oh, it's on here. Uh, the additional sort of audiobook version, the audiobook little essay of uh, The Poison of Subjectivism, which I mentioned has a lot of the same material, but not in exactly the same way. So what did you think, broadly speaking, of, um, of Lewis's points in this chapter, or in the essay, or anything surrounding it? What did you think? Yeah, so, so what he's looking at are a few different frameworks of how we understand value, right? Value or, or what we might call valuation, how we value things, um, what we take to be our fundamental values, something like that. Um, and he's more or less setting up a couple of competing theories about value or about core values or that sort of thing. Um, one is what he calls the doubt traditional morality, natural law. He uses really vague terms for it because it's a vague category, and that's something we can probably talk about a little bit. Um, but then competing with this, he's setting up what he takes to be the sort of the project of the green book, Gaius and Titius, the thing we, we, were, we were talking about in the previous chapter. And he puts forward that they're uh, an alternative by either them or people like them or people with the same uh, sort of outlook um, is that uh, instead of having particular values, uh, things that we think are important, that we stick by, that are, uh, that are sort of consistent principles, et cetera, what we have are instincts. And those instincts ought to be followed, or that we must follow instinct, or that we will, or that we do, or that that's another problem with it being a little bit vague. So we're setting up instinct as a, uh, as a sort of competing theory with what he's trying to put forward. And so, to that end, he, uh, he puts forward some defenses of this sort of traditional morality, this, this, um, this general way of thinking about how and why we value things. And then he also puts forward um, some criticisms of basing value on instinct. And then he also puts forward, late in the chapter, some criticisms of, of sort of wiping away uh, value systems in general, and instead um, relying upon simple choice or, uh, or what we choose to value in, uh, in light of nothing in particular. So that's, I think, a, a sort of general summary of what he's trying to do in this chapter. Anything else, anything we noticed about this in particular that we want to uh, address or anything in here that was unclear that I ought to clear up or at least try to clear up? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of talk about like human nature, mm -hmm. um, and then like man, and like who would. It's not. I mean, I don't know if that was the right word, but there was like um, definitely some like different adds to like values or different um, morals that they both opposed to. Mm -hmm. Like what? Um, Example. So sort of broadly speaking, it's kind of what they're, what he's arguing about here is something like um, sort of what, uh, let me put it this way, what's going on in the background of what he's arguing about is what it is to be human, what is human nature, and what impact does that have on our ethics, on our values. Um, and is that how and where we derive our values? Because Again, like we said, on the one hand, there's fundamental instinct, which is treated as something different from uh, what you might call natural law, based like the the ethical structure of how and how how we should act given our natures. These sound really similar, but they wind up being uh, being ultimately somewhat different. But how? Uh, so what what are some of the what are some of the things that he brings up as uh, as hard cases as test cases for this difference? How do we look at what are some cases where where he thinks that these views will radically differ? In other words, I mean, I know there was one example I wrote about. It was um, I know like between like the different like the signs that we're talking about, like the different um, how to be transparent, like um, like how to open your mind mm -hmm. to um, the things, the ideas. to conflict, I don't know. 
I know what you're talking about. I know about. I'm saying it wrong. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Let me find exactly where he talks about that, because it's late in the chapter. Um, because this is where he goes on to um, not particularly criticize this idea of instinct, and not really even go on to criticize particularly the the sort of ethical system that, that the Green Book and others are putting forward, but to criticize how they are criticizing it, how they are implementing their changes, and why they take these changes to be important. Um, yeah, here, it's this little section here, basically this paragraph. Um, and this is where he goes into this and some surrounding points, is where he goes into this, this idea that there are, there are two ways to criticize or to change a system. Uh, one is internal and one is external. So what does that mean? What's he getting at there? I mean, man versus man, like versus man versus society, like everything we've learned in like, I feel like high school, where you know you got like your self conflicts, uh, battles within yourself, and then also to like the society as a whole and um, accepting like uh, different beliefs or practices or. So that's, hmm, I hadn't thought about that way. I hadn't thought about it exactly that way. Um, but I think you're onto something, yeah. right? I think, I, I genuinely think you are onto something there. Um, because, I mean, let's, let's think about it this way. Lewis was first and foremost, uh, he was a scholar of the English language and of literature. So a lot of his examples are drawn from literature and a lot of the way that he's sort of structuring all this together is in terms of the way that we find conflicts depicted, and the way that we understand ourselves. And a lot of that has to do with these, the kinds of conflicts that you're talking about, like the, the internal conflict of how we understand ourselves and the kind of introspection that that, that, that brings up versus the kind of man versus society, right? the, the, another form of uh, sort of classic literary conflict where there is the, uh, rather than it being a sort of self-reflection, a kind of self-reform, it is impressed upon us from the outside. And so I think that that is, uh, if nothing else, certainly a really, good, um, a really good analogy for the kind of thing that he's talking about. Um, so specifically, when he, when he goes into this and looks at how we reform ideas, especially broad schemes of ideas, he's got two, he's got two things to talk about. One is language, which he knows a ton about, and the other is, uh, is ethical systems, which is what he's primarily trying to talk about. And he says that, the, well, there's, no, okay, it'll come back. He says that, broadly speaking, that there are two ways to reform a system. And one is, I think, analogous to uh, the way that we self-reflect and maybe criticize ourselves. And the other is how we might try to impress change upon something from outside, right? Um, the organic and the surgical, as he says. Um, and so if we want to take that, that analogy, I think that, uh, I think that this works. Is, so why would you want to change yourself? Why is it that you would have conflict with the way you see yourself or the way that you're acting? I think that, that is, that's more fundamentally a conflict between self and other or self and society. So if it's a matter of other people think that there's something wrong with me, or other people are, are putting pressures upon me to be a certain way, that's really more like a conflict I have with somebody else, rather than something I have with myself. So if really, if, if it's something more like upon reflection, I notice that there are problems that I have that I think I ought to fix, why would you think that? I mean, I would say like, you know, during experiences within nature or itself, not just people, you know, your environment changes you, and with that, you have to change your judgment, your, you know, your, the way you, I don't know, with morals, but you, the way you process stuff. From the dad? You know, when I was, when what you said was, um, okay. you didn't think about what you said, the way you think, okay, situations change the way, you have to adapt to things. Okay, so yeah. Right, so maybe maybe you need you realize that you need to change because you're encountering difficulty, right? Um, I need to develop better habits because I know that I realize that the habits I have are are self-destructive or not conducive to the way I'm living my life. Yeah, 
right? So let me make a distinction here. Um, and I think it's a useful one that we, we, sort of, we sort of intuitively grasp, but usually don't make explicit. Um, and it's between the two different kinds of causes. Um, one, which Aristotle calls efficient cause, is um, the kind of cause which leads to something else. Right? So it's the kind of cause of, of something like, if we're, to, if we're to just talk about my cup of coffee, for example. Good example. You can ask something like, why is this coffee hot? And you can give an answer of something like, I heated it up to make the coffee. Right? That's the kind of causal sequence which goes from the past into the present. Because I did certain things which led to it being a certain way. But if I were to ask, why is the coffee hot, there's another kind of answer that I could give. How else might you answer that question? Uh huh. What was the second one? Okay, but that's still the same kind of causal sequence. You're still thinking in the same in the same rough way, right? Things that led to it being in in its current state or its current configuration. So if I if I were to say um, why is it hot? in the sense of why is it being kept hot? Or why was it made hot? Because the thermos. That's what's keeping it hot. Yeah, but that's what you asked. I asked that, or I might have asked something else, because I wasn't clear about it. Because we're never clear about when we ask why what something is, is the case. Hot? Yeah. No, no, no. Means, why, is it, the why is the coffee kept hot? Oh, because, you, because it tastes? Yeah, because coffee, coffee tastes better at not room temperature, right? Well, people would disagree with you on that. I think they're wrong. Ice coffee, ice coffee is not at room temperature like either. Coffee. That's different. Yeah, but it's, then it's still not high. Right, you're right. But, OK, let me put it this way. Um, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a, Jesus said something about this, uh, that, if, uh, that if, 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 uh, if, you are, if you are lukewarm, then I will spit you from my mouth, that, that whole thing. He was talking about coffee, too, you know? Um, I mean, at least by analogy. Um, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> the point is that I'm keeping the coffee hot by doing all these things that I'm doing, keeping it in the thermos, keeping the thermos closed, uh, having heated up this morning when I made the coffee, et cetera, all of this, for a particular end, right? This is what Aristotle called the final cause. This is what something is directed towards. So we can ask both of these kinds of questions. Right? We can ask what puts something into its current state. And then we can also ask, why is it in its current state? Like, what is it there for? Right? So if I, um, if I happened across you at Publix down the street and said, hey, what are you doing here? And you say, well, I got in my car this morning, and I drove down to Publix, and then I got out of the car and walked into the store, you would be a crazy person, right? That's the, obviously the wrong kind of answer, even though it's a straightforwardly correct answer to my question. Really what I'm asking is, hey, why have you come to Publix? What, have you, what are you here to do? Right? What, are you, what are you getting? What are you picking up here for lunch? That kind of thing. Right? And so we can ask, sort of going back to the topic of self-reform, why we might reform ourselves in the sense that, well, I noticed something wrong about myself, and I want to reform it. I want to fix it. But then we can also ask why we want to do that. What is the end goal? What is the purpose of this? What inspires us or what drives us or what guides us towards wanting to reform ourselves? Is it that somebody is impressing upon, it from, uh, upon us from outside and we want to in some way conform to or please them? Or maybe we want to push against them. That's another option as well. That, that can happen in terms of like, you know, if, if, if somebody is pushing you to be a certain way, totally normal response and maybe even a good response to say um, no and react against it, depending on the situation. But if it's entirely internal, then why would you want to change yourself? Yeah, right. You, you want to make yourself worse? I mean, most of us don't want to do that, but it's, I suppose, a possibility. Um, now, whether that's a genuine possibility or not, we'll shove off until a few weeks from now. 
because um, it might not be a possibility at all, like psychologically speaking. Um, but typically, if we are to change something about ourselves, sort of alter from within, the reason we would have for doing so is because, um, to put it in a way that sounds maybe trite, we love ourselves. I want what is best for me. And so, if I recognize that what is best for me is a certain change, then I'm going to try and implement that change. By contrast, if somebody else from outside is wanting to change me, they may or may not have my best interests at heart. And there's a much lower chance that even if they do have my best interests at heart, they will know what will be best for me in order to change. Because they don't you know, live my life. I am usually the best judge of what is best for me, as long as I've got my principles in order and as long as I know what I'm talking about, at least to some degree, which is, again, why typically, uh, with respect to ethics, we start with these broad abstract principles to figure out what makes things better, what makes things worse, how to, how to, um, how to act in conformity with that, but not in the particular situation. Right? Which is why, generally, we don't start ethics with, ah, yes, how have you behaved this morning and how, how would you have behaved differently if you're thinking ethically. Rather, it's talking about things like, what are the general rules of right behavior, et cetera? Right? How you apply that to your particular situation, you know best about that. Again, assuming you understand your situation and understand the, the abstract principles of it. But if you understand all of that, then these kinds of changes from within are always necessarily with an eye towards uh, what's best for what undergoes the changes. So, to what he's saying here about language. Let's go with the analogy first. So he's talking about changes in language. Changing a language, um, making alterations to its, uh, to its spelling or its grammar or its structure or its idiom or whatever, changing the way that a language works, inventing new words, uh, presenting new ways of using existing words, that sort of thing. You can understand two different ways of this happening. One is sort of organically, that words are just used in different ways. And those new uses are sort of in line with how speakers of the language naturally develop the language moving forward. Um, for example, something that irks me but I have to, I, I'm basically forced to admit that it is common parlance at this point. Um, the word hate, ironically, because I absolutely hate this change, but the word hate, is this a noun or a verb? Right, it can be both, right? Realistically speaking, it can be both. That's a new development. Right? That's a new development, like within my lifetime, new development. Um, the grammatically correct term like in a dictionary up through at least the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, the noun was hatred. Hate was exclusively a verb. And I still stick to this. I'm, 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 I'm hard line about this for some personal idiot reason. But we have developed the use of the English language to accept the word hate to apply as a noun in particular in certain contexts. And the reason we do that uh, might just be because it's shorter than hatred. It might just be to combine uh, combine word uses. Um, or uh, it might be because it captures a slightly different, if not meaning, then at least a slightly different connotation than the word hatred. Hate being something like a pattern of behavior, hatred being something like a, um, uh, something like a uh, particular feeling or sensation, maybe something like that. Again, I'm not being precise about this, but maybe it's something along those lines. That's something that has to develop from within. That is not something that you could sort of, I don't know, as a, uh, as a native French speaker, look at the English language and find that there are these two words that ought to be combined into one. So the changes, so this kind of change from without sort of thing is, here's another silly example. Um, you, know how, uh, you know how most English people despise using the metric system but use it anyway? So a um, perfect example of this is, uh, is English pub culture. What's the standard drink 
at an English pub? Size, drink size. It's a pint, right? OK, so if you ask, what's the standard drink size at an English pub? It's a pint, right? it's two cups. It's imperial system, right? It's the thing that we still mostly use in the US, uh, outside of the hard sciences. Um, but because of, uh, because of uh, European Union trade stuff, uh, typically it gets shifted over to, uh, to half liters or liters. And if you ask anyone who goes to a pub regularly in English, and I, I know it in, in England, I know enough English people to know this, that half, uh, a half liter is not enough, and a full liter is really too much for, for, one, for one serving. It's annoying. They hate it. They absolutely despise this. Because, uh, and yet, if you ask anyone who's from Germany, no, it's fine. Like a liter is perfectly normal. A half liter is fine if you're not drinking as much. It's because this is an internal change versus an external change. Culturally speaking, uh, the the metric system was sort of imposed upon England, and it didn't develop there like it did in continental Europe. Something that that sort of organically develops has a way of working within the system that's already set up, as it's already set up. Developing, growing, and changing, but that's very different from uh, from sort of changes imposed from without in order to uh, maybe still trying to improve things, but trying to improve things without an understanding of how things already work. That's what Lewis is saying is going on here, and what the difference is between the sort of internal ethical reform and the external ethical reform. Um, the internal ethical reform, he uses the example of um, um, the Confucian do, uh, do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. Right? So a negative, um, a, a negative prompt to, uh, to not, uh, not interfere with what others would not like you to interfere with. Right? But that the, uh, the Christian do as you would be done by, so in other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, a positive command, is a natural development from the same principle, even if it's different. And as he says, the only reason to reject the do as you would be done by uh, precept is because you think it goes too far or it's unnecessary. Right? If you think that it is enough, uh, ethically speaking, uh, that, that maybe that goes too far, maybe that that will lead to excesses in some cases. Right? Maybe some other people would not appreciate you doing what you would like done to you, something like that. So maybe that does go too far. And that's a discussion that we can have from this internal perspective. OK, so we're, we're saying that this, this initial principle we have is, is, is right. Should it go further? That's very different from should we fundamentally alter the way that we think about these things and instead say, um, instead of say prioritizing what we, uh, what we ought to do or avoid doing to others, rather we should start thinking about things in terms of the species as a whole rather than our interpersonal relationships. Fundamentally different way of thinking about things. So that's a kind of reform from outside, and why it's why it's um, why it's alien to the, the sort of natural or organic development of how we think about things. Right? His example right there at the end: it's the difference between a man who says uh, says to us, "You like your vegetables moderately fresh? Why not grow your own and have them perfectly fresh? Right? You know, grow vegetables in your backyard. It's a good idea." Um, and a man who says, "Throw away that loaf and try eating bricks and centipedes instead." There's a big difference between extending a principle um, to either its natural conclusion or maybe beyond its natural conclusion and starting over from scratch. Like, if you like the convenience of, say, a, uh, a general department store or a general grocery store, say, that you can get any kind of groceries that you want rather than having to go to the grocer, the butcher, and a, like a bunch of different individual stores in a market, then you'll probably also like the convenience of, say, uh, of like online shopping, having it delivered to you. That's very different from, uh, from, saying, from justifying that very same conclusion by saying that, well, the way that we've always done things has been, uh, has been terribly inefficient, that, that going out to stores is a... Um, is an inefficient method due to something like the separation of uh, the, the, the individual, uh, what's it called, um, specialization and trade sort of thing, right. opportunity costs, that, that it's best to have 
me do my thing and somebody else deliver things to me because that's their specialization rather than mine, et cetera. I'm wasting my time by doing, going out and doing it. That's an external kind of criticism rather than just developing from what's already there. Even if they come to the same conclusion, it's a radically different reason for reaching the conclusion. And so what Lewis is arguing is that, is that if we're going to make moral developments, it should be from this kind of internal, uh, this internal critique, this internal perspective, uh, rather than trying to sort of alter from outside or alter from having a, uh, from trying to come up with a fundamentally new perspective, which he also thinks is impossible, but that's a slightly separate issue. I went off on that point a while. Uh, anything else, uh, any, any, uh, any points about what we've just talked about in that one paragraph? Um, or anything related to it that we wanted to, wanted to discuss. A couple of other things I can bring up, if you'd like, mm -hmm. if you'd prefer that way. Um, first of all, uh, this here on the second page of the chapter, where he emphasizes this, <clears throat> that uh, he says, in actual fact, Gaius and Titius will be found to hold with, uncom with complete uncritical dogmatism the whole system of values that happened to be in vogue among moderately educated young men of the professional classes during the period between the two wars. And he goes on to say basically that, um, that this skepticism about values, this, this sort of reductionism that we were talking about last time, uh, this idea that we should, uh, we should consider statements of value to be merely statements about our own feelings, our own emotions, that that really is only to apply to other people's values, the, the way that things have been traditionally thought of, but not the way that they want to think about the world. That they are not wanting to uh, apply that same criticism to their own way of thinking. Lewis's reason for thinking this is that, is that, well, straightforwardly, you could perfectly well apply the same criticism to any system of ethics or any system of morality that you put forward, even if it is based on instinct or if it's based on uh, well, whatever they might put forward as an alternative. And part of that is to notice uh, something similar to, that, to what, um, to what uh, McIntyre pointed out, is that a lot of these, these ethical systems that we, that we develop are importantly settled within a particular uh, cultural and temporal context. They, are, uh, they develop here and they develop now, and they develop in a particular way because they develop here and now. And so if we, if we look to, I forget if he has this in the notes at the end of the chapter or if this is at the end of the book. But he actually goes through and, yeah, here we go. Um, he goes through and, and uh, figures out exactly what their value system is. And it's, it's very particular to a particular sort of person in a particular social context. He summarizes it thus. Um, he says, it will, it will be seen that conform, comfort and security, as known to a suburban street in peacetime, are the ultimate values. Those things which can alone produce or spiritualize comfort and security are mocked. Man lives by bread alone, and the ultimate source of bread is the baker's van. Peace matters more than honor and can be preserved by jeering at kernels and reading newspapers. So the idea is, again, a kind of, um, a kind of um, security within, uh, within middle class society, rather than anything that is that has to do with anything beyond that particular context. And again, he uses some examples. He brings he brings out um, examples that Gaius and Titius use to show that this is this is the kind of thing that he's talking about. And this is an ethical system that was in vogue at the time because it was uh, it was based around a particular uh, particular cultural developments in England in the twenties and thirties. And this is very different from what sort of popular ideas of ethics that, that, are, uh, that are still these kinds of external reforms might develop and might, uh, the, the kinds of things that we might see in other places in other times. But it's the same kind of issue. And that's what he wants to emphasize here. It's not that, uh, that this, this way of thinking about ethics in particular is flawed in some fundamental way. It's that the fundamental way in which this is flawed is the same flaw that we might find with any kind of sort of moral innovator kind of system, trying to completely make a clean sweep of ethics and start over. And so that's what he sees to be the, sort of the problem with what they're putting forward. 
which, uh, let's see. And if we look at how it, uh, how it sort of disintegrates, how this method disintegrates ethical norms, we'll see that, again, it, it applies pretty much universally. It's a universal solvent, to use a, an analogy that he does. Um, if we say that ethics should be based upon rationality, or should be based upon, um, what are some of the other ways he describes this? Uh, real or basic values, rather than sentimental ones. Um, things that are based on, say, instinct, or, uh, or the preservation of the species, or uh, preservation of society, or things like that. Uh, that these are, and this is the key point that he makes, these are necessarily something that is commonly found in traditional morality as he understands it, but taken to be the, the single most important principle or the most important value at the expense of everything else. Why is that important? Why is that important to Lewis's argument that any of these innovations or these, these new systems of morality will necessarily borrow from traditional morality or the Tao or the way or whatever he wants to call it? Why is that so important for his argument? Why does that matter for the fact that Lewis thinks that these moral systems will ultimately disintegrate or, or deconstruct themselves? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, so yes, he absolutely does think that that real moral advances do happen. Right? That that uh, so long as we are not just trying to start over from square one, not trying to reinvent the wheel, that we can improve the wheel. Right. That uh, to again to keep with the wheel analogy, that you know modern uh, you know modern street tires are definitely superior to wagon wheels. But it's not like we tried to like, reinvent the way that vehicles move with you know, round things on an axle, because that's actually a pretty good idea. Right? That's a pretty good way of moving things around, heavy things around in particular. And that if we wanted to start over, uh, that we would probably either, one, wind up with exactly the same thing anyway, and just having wasted a whole lot of time trying to do it, or wind up with something that is radically different, but also radically ineffective. We really want to reinvent the way we carry heavy things. Let's go with sleds. Okay, fine. That works maybe in a very precise particular context of, you know, ice and snow, say. But it also needs to be powered with some, by something with traction. And so it doesn't work in general. It doesn't work even there as well. Um, and it also doesn't work more broadly. So that's part of the problem. Why else? Why else is this important? That, that why, is, why else is it important that he thinks that whenever the innovator comes up with a new moral system, what they're doing is they're, they're taking one aspect of the Tao or traditional morality and taking that to be the, the most fundamental or the most important. Why is that such a problem? Let me quote, quote some of the relevant parts here. I'll skip around a bit. So he uh, begins by pointing out that the, uh, the Tao, or natural law, traditional morality, first principle to practical reason, whatever, um, are the sole source of all value judgments. Um, the effort to refute it and raise a new system of value in its place is self-contradictory. There has never been and never will be a radically new judgment of value in the history of the world. What purport to be new systems, or as they now call them, ideologies, all consist of fragments of the Tao itself. So this is what I was saying. <clears throat> Arbitrarily wrenched from their context, in the whole, and then swollen to madness in their isolation, yet still owing to the Tao and to it alone such a validity as they possess. Uh, skipping ahead, the rebellion of new ideologies against the Tao is a rebellion of the branches against the tree. If the rebels could succeed, they would find that they had destroyed themselves. The human mind has no power of inventing a new value than of imagining a new primary color. What's he saying there? What's his point? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so the DAO is why, why our values are valued, why they're proper values, why we think that they're, uh, they're, uh, they're worth respecting and worth following. If the reason for that is, uh, is that they are part of this, this inherited structure of value, then by taking one part of it, like away from the rest, and then trying to get rid of the rest of these traditional values and try and replace them with some new system, which is itself based on one of these values, then in trying to get rid of the rest of them, what you're doing is you're undermining the one value that you've taken because it only finds its justification as part of the whole system. It's only justified as part of uh, this system of traditional morality. And if you don't have that whole system in place, then the one piece of it that you've taken to be fundamental also loses its justification. Okay. And so an example, uh, example that he uses uh, uh, repeatedly, both in the last chapter and in this one, is uh, honorable death. Right? Um, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is, a, it is a sweet and seemly thing to die for one's country. Um, or um, uh, or, to, uh, or to, to die for the sake of something greater than oneself. Which, if you want to keep that, but get rid of something like um, our obligation to, uh, to talks about uh, so our obligations to the past or to our ancestors or to those which come before that which that from which we spring. If we want to get rid of that as superstitious, and we but we want to keep this this uh, this value of noble death, we can't. Right? They're interrelated. They rely on one another. Or if we want to keep, say, uh, the obligation that we find to uh, to the the material well-being of those who will come after us, but we want to dismiss say, our duties to, uh, to, uh, to pass on what we have learned to them. We want them to be better off. We want our, our children, our descendants to be better off, but we don't want to pass on to them what we have received in the same way. Again, those rely on one another, and without one, the other collapses as well. Okay, so why does he think that there is this close of a connection? Why is it that he thinks that without this particular, uh, without this particular set, this this big interrelated set of values, why does he think that that is the the sole only justification? There's a point he goes over a few times. It's because he has a particular assumption going on here, and the assumption is um, we can look at this two ways. I'm going to take the charitable route first, and then I'm going to say what I think he actually means, which I think is incorrect. Um, so the charitable right, reading of this is that without this solid structure that we've received from, from, uh, from our ancestors, from posterity, et cetera, that, uh, that there is no way to bridge what is called the is-ought gap, or, the, uh, or what is also called the fact-value distinction, or the fact-value dichotomy. As he says it here, the innovator is trying to get a conclusion in the imperative mood out of premises in the indicative mood. So what does that mean? He's a grammarian, so what, is, what does that mean grammatically? Indicative versus imperative. Switch it. Indicative and imperative. Indicative is facts. Uh, imperative is value. Indicative indicates what is. Imperative uh, impels to what ought to be, what ought to be done, right? Um, so the, the, the examples he gives are, um, this will preserve society, and society ought to be preserved, right? This will preserve society is indicative. That tells us that doing this thing will have these results. It is uh, wertfrei, or value-free, to use the, the sort of German term that, that is tossed around a lot in, in economics literature, for example. Um, because economics is supposed to be this kind of merely indicative kind of process. It's a good example of this sort of thing. But if you're just going to have statements like, this will preserve society, or this will benefit you, or this will benefit people around you, or something like that, you can always just come back with, so what? Why should I preserve society? Why would I want to help people around me? And if I don't want to, then, then knowing that it will do so gives me no reason to act. 
what we need is something already in the imperative or something that gives us a reason for doing something, saying that not just this will preserve society, but society ought to be preserved. It is a good thing to do that, right? And he says that based on the way that the innovator is thinking, that this gap cannot be bridged because what the innovator is talking about are merely factual propositions, propositions which are only about um, um, particular data about the world that does not include ought statements. And without some kind of an ought statement already baked in, you're not going to get any ought statements as conclusions. Um, he goes on uh, near the end, once he wraps back around to this point. So he says, the person who stands outside the Tao, the very starting point of ethics, is invisible. He may be hostile, but he cannot be critical. He does not know what is being discussed. This is why it is also said that this people, uh, this people that knoweth not the law is accursed, and he that believeth not shall be damned. An open mind in questions that are not ultimate is useful. But an open mind upon the ultimate foundations, either of theoretical or practical reason, is idiocy. If a man's mind is open on these things, let his mouth at least be shut. So what Lewis is saying here with respect to ethics is that if you're not starting with these first principles, good is to be done, bad is to be avoided, society is to be preserved, uh, other people are to be respected, um, ancestors are to be honored, and children are to be venerated, all are, flip that, all, uh, ancestors are to be venerated, and children are to be, uh, are to be, are delightful, and to be, uh, to be protected, etc. Right? If you don't take all of this as starting points, as unquestioned premises, you're not capable of thinking in terms of ethics. That these are unquestioned starting points. And so these are the equivalent in practical reason, in other words, in ethical reasoning, uh, that the first laws of logic that we talked about, non-contradiction, are to theoretical reasoning, thinking about the, the factual matters, indicative stuff. Now, that is the charitable way of reading this. The uh, uncharitable way of reading this is that, in the last two minutes of class, that he's basically falling into the same, uh, the same error that, uh, that McIntyre is pointing out. That he is taking this system of traditional morality as a given. And he thinks that it cannot be ultimately justified rationally, aside from it just being baselines of reason. And he's taking this fact-value dichotomy as, uh, as a genuine distinction, as a, as a gap that cannot be bridged. Now, we can point to this being a problem, and we're going to later. So this is something to keep in mind. And that this is, I think, a, a, a fundamental problem with Lewis's argument. Because he has all of this, this, the Tao, right? Traditional morality. That he thinks is sort of just self-justifying because it's apparent, right? It's self-apparent obvious. But, and then he says, well, you can't just demand to know why. What good does it do? Who said so, right? It is never permissible, quoting, not because it's harsh or offensive, because no values can uh, at all can justify themselves on this level. That's a huge assumption, that no values can justify themselves against a charge of why, what good will it do? Why must this be obeyed? Now, maybe he's right, and that we do need to just simply accept all this as a given. But that's a big step to take. And I think it's a step maybe too far and that we need to examine that a little more closely, but we'll examine that in another like three or four weeks. Um, point being is this is actually something to keep in mind very much for later is that yes, this whole system of maybe traditional morality or whatever is a, a sort of internally coherent system and it, and it is mutually justifying. But maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe there is something backing it all up. That maybe we don't just have to sort of accept this all on blind faith and just go with it. So maybe he's, he's, he's jumping the gun a little bit. 